Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terry McVenus, the president and CEO of RTCA. Greetings from our nation's capital and welcome to all of you to what is now our 17th in a series of webinars we call Aviation Technology Connect. We're very pleased to have created this series um, via this platform to hear from a, a variety of aviation industry leaders on a broad spectrum of topics, which will educate you, further inspire you in your profession, and perhaps even evolve your thinking as to where the industry is today and where it's going in the future. Now, over the past year and a half since we started these webinars, they've been highly successful, exceeding all of our expectations here at RTCA. We've attracted an international audience each month, not only from here in the United States, but also from Canada, countries across Europe, the Middle East, Africa, South America, Australia, and New Zealand. We believe that today's webinar is going to be equally exciting and informative. And uh, by the way, these, these previous webinars were all recorded, as is this one. Uh, so if you want to go back and listen to any of our previous webinars, you can find those recordings on the RTCA YouTube channel. We've been holding these webinars on the third Wednesday of each month, and, and like today, each of these webinars focus on a particular topic uh, where you'll gain some insight from aviation leaders that I'm confident will be inspirational, strategic, or even thought-provoking, with the primary goal of them giving you, the audience, the, the gift of their knowledge. Now, I know many of you watching today are familiar with RTCA, but I also see that we have some first-time visitors with us. So I want to take just a couple of minutes to familiarize you with who we are. Uh, RTCA is an aviation-centered standards development organization whose mission is to inspire the creation and the implementation of integrated performance standards that meet the changing global aviation environment and further ensure the safety, the security, and the overall health of the aviation ecosystem. Now, in addition to developing standards, we also provide training to government and industry personnel on the application of those standards in developing the basis for certification and testing. And on the screen, you can see some of our upcoming training events that are gonna be happening next month for DO-178C, DO-254, and DO-160G. And you can sign up for any of those courses via our website at www.rtca.org. Now, if you're interested or have any questions about our training, our, our standards development work, or are interested in becoming part of the RTCA family of members so that you too can have a voice in developing these standards, you can contact us directly either through our website or via telephone. Now, our ability to bring you these webinars would not be possible without the generous sponsorships from our industry partners. Today, I'm especially thankful to the Airline Pilots Association International, Collins Aerospace, and the National Air Traffic Controllers Association, all of whom are our gold corporate sponsors for uh, this year's uh, webinar series. Now, on this platform, you're gonna be able to submit questions to our speaker today. So to do so, you just click on the Q&A tab and I'll do my best to get all of your questions answered. So let's get started. Um, for those of us that grew up in the 1960s, one of the exciting developments of that time was our venture into space and the landing of Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin on the moon in July of 1969. The Apollo program was, was truly the foundation for further human spaceflight capabilities. But beyond the fantastic feat of human spaceflight and the subsequent lunar landings, many dual purpose technologies that were created by NASA that during that time have be, become day-to-day -day additions to our life here on Earth. Things like cordless power tools, fireproof materials, uh, heart monitors, solar panels, and many other things came directly from those early days of discoveries from the Apollo missions. Now, lots happened since those early NASA spaceflight missions to the moon. Uh, today, not only is NASA involved in space, but a whole new cottage industry has developed that's changing the paradigm and shifting space exploration to the private sector. SpaceX, Blue Origin, we hear a lot about them. They're, they're in the news a lot, but there's many other companies involved as well uh, in this whole commercial space business. And that's the topic of this month's RTCA webinar. So I'm pleased to have with us today, Ms. Karina Dries, the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, a position she's held since January of last year. Now she came to the Commercial Space Flight Federation with a, with a fabulous background in this industry, spanning some 
20 years in a variety of senior leadership roles at space and technology companies. Prior to her current positions, she served as the CEO and general manager of the Mojave Air and Spaceport. She currently also serves as the vice chairman of the FAA's Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee, which we'll talk a little bit later about. So Karina, welcome to RTCA. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much, Terry. I really appreciate the invitation and I'm really thrilled to talk with you and, and your members and your audience today about CSF and some of the amazing things that the industry is working on. Um, I'd like to start with a, uh, with a video, if we can, um, just to highlight some of the uh, progress that the industry has made and some things that we're, we're uh, working on to give you kind of a sneak peek of what's happening in commercial space. For that. So as you can see, uh, the industry has made a lot of progress um, in recent past and will continue to strive for a lot more progress in the future. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the major milestones that have happened, um, some of the uh, background of CSF, just to, in case anyone needs a little bit of an overview of the industry association itself. And then I'll briefly talk a little bit about what's coming up for commercial space. Um, so just a little bit about the Commercial Space Flight Federation. So we're essentially the leading trade association that represents the interests of the commercial space industry in the U.S. And that is really has um, all of the, the companies that are involved, all of our members that are involved, really have um, a, a, a huge initiatives to continue advancing American leadership in space. And that involves not only um, advocating for the industry and for favorable policy and regulation, but it's also really duly about inspiring the next generation of scientists and engineers to continue pursuing these, these uh, STEM careers. So just a few things that CSF sort of strives for and, and works on on behalf of the industry. So first and foremost, we advocate for important commercial space issues. Um, we host and organize events that bring together key leaders in government. So that's an opportunity for us to exchange information, educate each other about what's happening in the industry and what the government's uh, needs might be, um, in addition to other industry leaders that have a lot of information to share with each other. And one of the things that CSF has done really well over the past, uh, his, or over our 15 year history really, is develop consensus within the space industry on really key issues. And this helps um, helps members of the government really understand what industry's priorities are. So we really work hard on this um, to advance a lot of interest for the industry. Uh, promoting policies and programs that allow the industry to flourish, continue to innovate, continue to make, uh, making sure that the best technologies are coming forward, and then uh, amplify communications with policymakers um, on member achievement. So this is sort of like a, a way to reiterate some of the important things that the industry has done and why some of these policies have been really important to the US space program. This, we've got 90 members now. So this is just sort of a flavor of some of our membership. It's by no means comprehensive, but it'll just give you some idea of the ecosystem now that the industry has sort of blossom into. It's not just launch and reentry anymore, 
It's an entire ecosystem of the space industry. So it's launch and reentry, it's infrastructure, satellite operators, manufacturers, um, professional services companies, on orbit companies, and a lot of universities and research institutions that now have a much larger interest in what's happening in the industry. Um, we did this analysis not too long ago just to try to understand how we've evolved over our 15 year history. Our members now employ over 75,000 people across the country. So it's a very uh, quickly, grow, uh, quickly evolving and growing market segment for uh, the US space program. And it is very diverse in terms of types of companies and what these companies can offer. So um, this is, you know, was really interesting to just kind of capture the, um, the breadth of our membership and try, to really try to understand where a lot of these jobs are taking place because space, as, as many people who've been involved in the industry know, um, really has kind of focused on Florida, Texas, California in the past. And you can see how it's really sort of blossomed into um, you know, practically this nationwide industry and continues to grow and spread. Um, and a lot of it really depends on where the talent is. Um, I, I won't go through this entire chart. This is something that I put together. This is something that I see as some of the major milestones uh, for the commercial space industry, specifically commercial space, not necessarily the entire space program, but how we sort of identify what's commercial focused um, and what's maybe more of a traditional government focused um, space initiative. So the first space tourist in 2001, I think, is a, is a pretty significant milestone for the industry because it, it really created this opportunity to open up space to more than just, uh, you know, a qualified NASA astronaut, for example, um, or another international uh, member of their space program to be able to go up to the ISS. We actually had an opportunity in 2001 for a private citizen to pay for a ticket to spend some time on the ISS. Um, and then, of course, Spaceship One days in 2004, which is what inspired me to get involved in the industry in uh, 2005. So this was a, a prize that was awarded to the first commercially launched vehicle to space, which was awarded by scale, uh, to Scale Composites in 2004 for the launch of Spaceship One. And people just kind of understood that, that the idea of um, average citizens going to space was becoming much closer to reality. So this was a pretty significant milestone. All the way up through uh, in 2020 and beyond, of course, uh, the um, idea of commercial vehicles being able to launch NASA astronauts up to the ISS. So that was another really significant milestone over that 15 year history. Um, and obviously a lot in between. The things, some of the things that I consider to be pretty significant milestones, things like reusability, the idea that we can reuse some of our uh, components and don't have to rebuild every single component every time we do a launch. That's a that's a game changer for something like the space industry. Um, you know, people have compared it to a commercial aviation. If you could even imagine having to throw away a 747 every time you would land doing a, a um, intercontinental flight or you know a long a long distance flight. So um, it's it's been pretty significant to see some of these milestones over the past. And we're really anxious to see more milestones going forward. So I know one of the areas of interest to a lot of the folks on this webinar is uh, the regulatory environment and what this looks like for, uh, for the commercial space industry. So we at CSF work very closely with our regulator. Um, we provide information about what's happening in the industry. We also provide in, uh, information from them to key members of the industry. So everyone has a good sense of what's happening, what some of the priorities might be. Um, I, put, I put this chart together just to kind of show this graphic of the increase in launch cadence over roughly a, a 10 year period. Um, starting with four launches back in 2010, all the way up through now 55 launches just last year, 2021. Um, and then I just differentiated the, the ones that are CSF members from the, the non-CSF members, which are um, usually more of the traditional companies that are providing services exclusively to the government. Just to be able to explain and, and illustrate the growth of the commercial sector and how this has uh, really impacted the entire environment, the regulatory environment, 
the policy uh, environment as well. So some of the things that you know we work closely with FAAST, which is our regulator on, are things like launch and reentry streamlining, uh, providing input to the 450 rule that came out recently, for example. Spaceport licensing is another area we uh, will provide feedback on, mostly through the Comstack, but AST also regulates commercial uh, spaceports. And then, of course, uh, human spaceflight standards development. So um, a lot of these are things that the industry is heavily involved with. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of touch briefly on the human spaceflight standards. So this has been an effort, I would say, going on for a really long time. So the industry has been involved in helping to develop and write uh, um, space, uh, human spaceflight standards based on FAA recommended best practices. And um, it has been a slow process, I will admit, largely because the industry wasn't quite ready to identify what some of these standards ought to be. They were still in development mode for a really long time. And we finally got into the point where we have enough knowledge now that we can bring everyone together to sit down and start working through a lot of these standards and a lot of the development here. So uh, we've worked through now six that are published for human spaceflight standards. Um, and we're working toward a lot this year, um, expecting some of these will probably slip into 2023, but I think this is really significant progress. So ASTM has taken the lead. They're another standards uh, body that is working on this effort, which they call F47. Um, and we work closely with them. We do as well as a lot of our members uh, that are involved in human spaceflight. So this process has been, as I mentioned, going on for quite some time, but I, but I expect that we'll start to see a lot more progress over the next year or two um, to the point where the standards will help our regulator as they develop and think about future regulation. And that's really the whole idea here. So. Um, I, I did want to touch a little bit on the future of space flight because that was part of um, part of the title of the talk. Uh, so just to put things in perspective, something like 600 people have gone to space um, in the world. It's a really low number. Um, 30 now are considered commercial astronauts. So obviously the key difference between like a NASA astronaut and a commercial astronaut is as a NASA astronaut, you're an employee of the government. You're an employee of NASA. Commercial astronauts could be anybody. They could be test pilots. They could be um, average citizens. Uh, obviously the price tags are uh, a little too steep right now for most people, for most middle-class Americans. Um, but the idea is it's, it's going to become more affordable as demand increases, supply will also increase, prices will come down, more people will begin to uh, experience it or have the opportunity to experience uh, human space flight. So Embry-Riddle estimates something uh, like four to eight, uh, four to 11,000 participants within the next 10 years. So that's a significant jump. When we look at 30 total uh, commercial astronauts today, the, the folks that are going to participate going forward will be considered space flight participants. Um, compared to the total number of 600 today. So it's a pretty significant jump. And, and I was actually on a panel uh, just on Monday this week at South by Southwest talking a little bit about space tourism. Um, and it was a really interesting discussion talking about how, uh, how it's becoming much more accessible for people to be able to go up into space. Um, I think it's kind of unfortunate that it got a lot of bad press in some areas last year because it's not at all about uh, billionaires going to space. It's not at all about that. It's all about having the perspective of being able to escape the planet for a few minutes and looking back at it, it's life-changing and everyone will tell you it's life-changing. Astronauts that have gone to space have all said the same thing. Um, that it changed their outlook on life. It changed the way they behave. It changed the way they treat their fellow humans, the way they treat the environment, the earth. And that's the whole idea. Um, there's, you know, there's this idea that it's, it's one or the other. It's a mutually exclusive uh, relationship. Either go, to, either go to space and care about space 
or stay on the earth and care about the earth. That's not at all what this is about. This is about being able to see the earth from a brand new perspective that you've never been able to see before. And most people haven't. So I'm really excited about what the future holds for human space flight specifically, uh, because I think that it's, it's going to be really a game changer for the planet and the way we treat the planet and being able to really appreciate what we have here. Um, there's, there's two elements to human space flight. There's the zero gravity experience and then there's the perspective of being able to see the earth from that level and the, the darkness of space, you know, out the other window is another uh, you know, pretty dramatic thing that you'll hear astronauts talk about. So we'll see a lot more people be able to experience this in our lifetimes. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that um, when people have those opportunities. So that's all I have for slides. I'm really looking forward to the discussion, um, to your questions and happy to answer any questions you all might have. Thanks, Karina. That was that was great. Um, I've got a number of questions here. I think maybe we'll just start with kind of that last topic that you 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 spoke about in terms of um, trying to make it more affordable for for people and getting more people exposed to it. Um, you know, we, we really do hear a lot about this is kind of a luxury experience for for some. And but 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 beyond expanding the, the you know getting the cost down and getting more people available. Do you, do you see any other um, uses or activities that may may come from an expanded uh, commercial space flight operations? Absolutely. So a couple a couple of the things that are happening at the same time. So there's the human space flight element, which is really that experience and that perspective of being able to appreciate the Earth. There's a significant subset also that's within the research community. So being able to open up space to the scientific community is a really significant aspect of the commercial space industry and what, what the industry can offer scientists. So when you think about people who study science, um, they have the opportunity to study in their own environments. So they can study um, you know, volcanoes, they can study, geologists can study you know, rocks on the earth, they can go anywhere on the earth that they want to, stu to study. Um, marine biologists have the opportunity to study in the oceans but we don't really have yet the opportunity for scientists to do their research in their own environment, which is um, I think a pretty remarkable thing to be able to offer the scientific community. So there are things being done in zero gravity that as you know, one, one of the things you mentioned early on Terry was uh, what opportunities exist for humans on earth based on research that we've done in space. And that's exactly what's happening in the zero gravity environment as well. So uh, we have a good partnership with the ISS National Lab as a country to, um, to be able to host some of these experiments up on the ISS. We will see other hab space habitats come online from a commercial perspective for both uh, the human spaceflight experience uh, and this uh, aspect of research as well. It, it probably kind of as a follow on, um, seems to me there's even some new uh, segments of the industry, even even total new industries that could kind of come out of all of this as well, I would think. Absolutely. So, you know, this is something that I would say just as an example, NASA does really well. So NASA will, you know, they own a patent portfolio of things that they may have come up with or discovered, um, and they will open that up to entrepreneurs to come and commercialize some of that technology. If They've developed, you know, um, opportunities to commercialize some of the technology. So there are definitely a lot of opportunities for things like um, being able to work either in a zero gravity environment or be able to commercialize some technology that may have been developed there uh, for applications here on Earth. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit more about the regulatory piece because that certainly is of interest to, to a lot of our our uh, audience, I think, or at least our members. Um, and I mentioned in the intro that I think you mentioned to uh, your role as the vice chairman on the, the FAA's Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee, the ComStack. So, so what is the ComStack? I mean, what does it do? Okay, that's a great question. So uh, the ComStack, it's, so it stands for Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee, and it's the industry advisory group to FAA AST. So for those who don't, who don't fully uh, understand the way FAA is structured, they have various offices based on 
um, the type of activity that's happening within the FAA. So air traffic control or uh, the air traffic office, for example, office of airports, aviation safety, and so on and so forth. AST is the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, and that's largely the regulator for the launch and reentry operators and commercial space ports. So the Comstack, which is an industry advisory group to FAA AST, um, provides recommendations to AST on various things that might impact the industry. So typically the way it works is AST comes up with certain topic areas um, where they want to see industry input. They'll give industry, they'll give the Comstack specific tasks to work through. Uh, the Comstack uh, has three separate working groups. So we've got a regulatory working group, a safety working group, and innovation and infrastructure working group. And based on the topic area, the working groups will work through some of these issues and then provide recommendations back to the entire Comstack. Um, and then the Comstack will then forward those recommendations onto FAAST. So it's a really good way to exchange information for industry, for members of the industry uh, that are all working on some of these challenges. But more importantly, it's an opportunity for industry to provide that feedback and information back to the FAA in terms of what, um, what we might recommend they do, what we might recommend they look at, um, what next steps might make the most sense for industry. So um, I will be uh, looking forward to um, serving as the chair for the next two years, starting this spring uh, and continuing to help AST and work on some of these topics. Excellent. Um, in addition to the FAA, um, how do, you, how do you work and collaborate with some of the other government organizations like NASA, um, uh, maybe the Department of Defense or MITRE or some of those other ones? That's a good question. So a lot of our members work very closely with a lot of different um, divisions in government. So um, CSF tends to work closely on, on commercial and civil um, opportunities more than national security, but a lot of our members definitely cross over into multiple areas. Uh, so, you know, we will continue working with a lot of different uh, folks in government to talk about what the industry is doing, what the industry's capabilities are, um, the strengths of a commercial space portfolio for a lot of the government uh, operator or the government employees, just so they understand kind of the key differences and why um, commercial has really helped to fast track a lot of the things that are happening in the industry now. So we do work very closely, not only with, with um, FAA, but also with NASA, as you mentioned, uh, working more closely with the Department of Commerce as they stand up the Office of Space Commerce as well and work on things like space situational awareness. Um, and uh, all of those roles are gonna be really important as we go forward as an industry. Um, what, what do you see as maybe some of the, the technical hurdles that are, that are gonna have to get over to um, you know, make commercial space transportation more available to the public? So um, I think the industry, at least from a launch and reentry perspective, the industry has made a lot of progress in um, helping to, or really helping to uh, um, perfect their own technology. They've had a lot of freedom and flexibility to, to really innovate um, under this sort of regulatory environment, which is re has been really important for the industry to get their best technology forward. Um, from a satellite industry perspective, and one of the things that I highlighted on the, that milestone timeline is this idea of having CubeSats now. So we used to have, um, when you think about satellites, not that long ago, you think these giant massive uh, machines that are floating around in space, and a lot of them now are just derelict up there, which is really unfortunate uh, because we've been able to uh, get to a point where the technology has enabled us to create really small satellites, um, which take up very little space in space, um, and in some cases, uh, you know, have um, very unique maneuverability capabilities. So um, I think, you know, we, from a technology perspective, having that freedom and flexibility to innovate has been absolutely critical. And, and you know, in, in the, at least in the airline commercial airline type of um, operations, you know, safety is such a, a big driving force. Um, how, how, does, how does this industry, the commercial space transportation industry, start, start really looking at from a, 
uh, a safety standpoint? Are there some hurdles that have to get over there as well? So that's a really important topic and it's one that uh, keeps coming up. And what I will say is um, this industry is really dedicated to safety for a lot of different reasons. I mean, the obvious one being it's their business on the line, their entire company on the line. So if they have a catastrophic accident, then they really risk having to close the business and everyone's out of job. Um, the entrepreneurs, um, you know, uh, might not get back into the industry for quite some time if they ever choose to do so. So safety is absolutely critical. And, you know, the industry for years got a lot of crit criticism for taking such a long time to come online, at least from a human spaceflight perspective, there was a lot of criticism there. And that chart that I showed you where Spaceship One achieved uh, spaceflight in 2004, and we're just now, you know, almost 20 years later, starting to see this become more frequent. And there was so much criticism over that time, you know, why is it taking so long? And it was all about safety. It was, you know, absolutely critical that these vehicles were safe. And so, you know, from my perspective, having been involved in the industry for 15 years now, um, I look at some of these milestone space flights that the entrepreneurs have taken. And I'm thinking like, these are the, these guys are the beta testers. You know, they were willing to get in their own vehicles and sort of prove out the, the safety of their own vehicles, which I think is pretty telling in terms of their confidence in, uh, in their own vehicles. Yeah. And, and certainly when you, when you look at the, federal regulations as it applies to airplanes, um, very much safety focused. And yeah. do, you, do you think you'll see the FAA or whether ultimate regulator may be for this to kind of start adopting some of those same kind of rules and regulations that impact safety mm -hmm. for commercial space? So it's really difficult. And I would tell you that the industry is really thinking hard about um, recommendations for future regulation. The challenge that we have is this is a brand new industry. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, one of, the, one of the difficulties and one of the reasons that CSF spends so much time advocating for the industry is to really educate uh, policymakers about the differences in different, uh, different types of vehicles. So commercial aviation, you know, is considered a, a common carrier mode of transportation. Our industry is years away from that, if ever, if that ever happens, you know, if we ever get to like a point to point scenario with a lot of these space vehicles. So it really is um, completely different from anything else we've ever seen. The vehicles are designed very differently from each other. So the risk I think in trying to regulate er too early is um, having a, an adverse effect on safety because right now the companies have a little bit of freedom and flexibility to design their own vehicles, be able to innovate um, to be able to create the safest vehicle possible for their companies. But what works for one company is not necessarily going to work for the next company. So it, it really allows for that, um, for that freedom and flexibility to innovate, which I think is absolutely critical when, it, when we think about safety. Yeah. Now, um, of course, the FAA doesn't, um, essentially doesn't regulate commercial space yet. I mean, they, they license the launches. Um, is there going to be a transition where it's going to be a little bit more regulated, you think? So this is one of the topics we're looking at under uh, through Comstack. So I mentioned the Comstack has a regulatory working group. Right. And, you know, there's a question about um, the type of regulation or what regulation we should, uh, the FAA should sort of work toward next. But there's also this question of what is the process of developing regulation? Um, especially for some of these new vehicles. So, you know, companies that are um, completing a, a launch and reentry application under the 450, the new 450 regulation, some of them are suborbital vehicles, some of them are orbital vehicles, some of them are balloons. You know, they all fall under that same regulatory environment right now. So um, that absolutely will happen in time. The question is, uh, what makes the most sense for both industry and the FAA in terms of being able to regulate um, safe, uh, safely really across all of those different vehicle designs. It's really not like anything we've ever seen before, um, you know, because there's something really unique about AST in having and being able to regulate 
vehicles that either go to space or the edge of space or have some level of propulsion system um, that requires them to fall under that 450 regime. So um, we, you know, we work very closely with them. Um, you know, you mentioned that they don't, uh, they don't regulate today. They can regulate, like there is some level of regulation that they can implement. Um, if, for example, there's a major, you know, safety issue uh, from somebody in the future, um, if something catastrophic might happen, then they can, they have the authority to come in and write some rules if there was something that they've identified as maybe a flaw in that particular system. Sure. Um, so kind of getting away from the, the regulatory component, um, how, does, how does your organization collaborate perhaps with some of the local communities where, where commercial spaceports are being considered? Oh yeah, that's a really good question too. And I can talk, you know, just from my experience in Mojave um, uh, from a spaceport perspective. So some, some commercial spaceports are sort of dual use. They're airports first and then they're, you know, spaceport sort of second or they evolve into spaceport, um, which is exactly what happened in Mojave. So, you know, we worked really closely with our local government uh, back there because uh, it was a big job creator, you know, so Mojave became a real economic engine in East Kern County where not a lot of, you know, economic activity existed. So um, there's, there's definitely an interest there, um, all the way up through working uh, through a member of Congress, uh, wanting to see things come online. Spaceport America has a very similar concept. They're not an airport, they're exclusively a spaceport but they sort of you know, evolved into this um, now ecosystem that they have in Spaceport America. Um, and we have a number of spaceports you know, in Alaska. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna be able to name them all, I just don't have time, but there's, there's now 13 licensed spaceports um, and they do everything from horizontal launch, uh, which is for those who don't know maybe the difference between horizontal and vertical. Horizontal launch simply means you have some kind of a rocket that is um, attached uh, to an aircraft of some sort, generally, um, that airplane flies up to a certain altitude and drops uh, the, uh, the rocket, the vehicle that's attached to be able to launch from a 30,000 foot level versus you know, the sea level. Um, and then you've got vertical launch vehicles and the size of vertical launch vehicles is varied um, across you know, very small launchers, suborbital launchers, all the way up to um, you know, really large vehicles and where they launch from is kind of dependent on um, a, often on the size of the vehicle. So um, the larger the vehicle, generally uh, the, the, uh, the larger the footprint of uh, the, the region um, that the spaceport needs to consider. Um, one of the questions coming in is, is regarding cybersecurity. And certainly it's something that's, I think we're all concerned about no matter matter what we're doing, um, how, how does any, any, how is cybersecurity impacting some of your members and maybe some of the work that you're doing? So that's a, also a really good question. And I will tell you that some folks um, had asked us, some folks in government had asked us, CSF um, early on, um, uh, you know, due to the war in, in uh, Ukraine, you know, whether companies were impacted um, and how, what that what that really looked like. The, this was really an opportunity to kind of talk about some of the issues cybersecurity wise in space. Um, and you know, we had an opportunity to talk about some of the benefits of the companies that are operating in space and what some of those companies had been able to do very quickly and adapt to this situation very quickly um, and be able to provide services in real time. But the threat of cybersecurity is very real, and you know, this is one of the uh, the topic areas that's getting a lot more attention uh, because of the potential of what, you know, what could happen if some of the satellites come offline, especially, you know, from a national security perspective if some of those government satellites come, come offline. So it's a topic area that's uh, absolutely of interest to not only our members, but to a lot of folks in government. Um, you, you mentioned the... Um, the numbers of, of commercial space launches. And I think, I think it was last year, there was like 52, if I'm not mistaken, commercial space launches, almost one every week. Do you have any sort of projections as to what's gonna happen this year and next year, maybe beyond? 
So it, it will not be, um, you know, one of the topics maybe I can talk a little bit about is the, the airspace and the integ integration to the NAS, because I think there's a perception out there that this cadence will keep on ticking up and up and up to the point where we're launching thousands of rockets a day. That <laughs> won't happen. Like we just don't have that nearly that much demand for, uh, for launching satellites into space. It will continue to increase, but at the same time, I, and I, no, I don't have like exact numbers for you in terms of projections, um, but even though those launches are increasing from an airspace perspective, and we're working closely also with ATO to identify ways that we can better integrate into the national airspace um, to shrink ideally the launch windows. So the FAA blocks the airspace for a, a period of four hours, which is a really long time, you know, understandably because they just want to ensure everything's out of the way. Um, so we're working closely with them and providing more information to them to be able to shrink these windows and open up that airspace much more quickly to commercial aviation. So uh, the ATO recently released their first phase of the space data integrator which is uh, essentially um, the data that's coming from the commercial space operators to the FAA to um, better coordinate in real time what's happening with that launch. Uh, so that FAA has uh, a lot better knowledge in real time in terms of when they can open up some of that airspace. Because that's really the key issue, I think. When we talk about launch cadence, I think the concern always is um, how long is that airspace gonna be blocked for each launch? Yeah, I know there's several um, industry associations here in, in DC that, and probably perhaps outside the Beltway as well, that certainly have expressed some concerns for this, this, you know, the growth of commercial space operations, and, and as you mentioned, and that that potential impact to their members, um, and the whole idea of airspace integration is something that you know we're, we've been addressing at RTCA with some of our members and some of the different. You know, new applications of, of aviation that are out there. And I think that's that's going to be a real key key thing going forward for, for everybody, not just your part of the industry, but, but others as well. So. Yeah, I agree with that. And I would also say, you know, I look forward to continue uh, engaging with our TCA. Uh, we've worked, CSF has worked in the past with ALPA on particular mm -hmm. topic areas. Um, I'm excited to uh, work more closely with ADCA. ADCA has a new president that I've talked with a couple of times. So, um, you know, this, I think this idea now that um, space has just been, or commercial space in particular has been so largely unknown by the aviation community. Our members are, you know, have been really good at connecting with a lot of folks that have these concerns and sharing information. Um, we participated, as an example, in a tour of the Cape alongside um, our, our commercial aviation friends and companies on the topic of, um, you know, of airspace access. So, it, you know, that information sharing has been really critical, and we, we definitely, CSF looks forward to continuing those conversations. Yeah, yeah the, the standards are, we're actually starting to get inquiries, probably from some of your members, but even, even from the FAA in terms of of um, potential work that needs to be done in, in developing some operational performance standards, which is you know, kind of in the realm of what we do. Um, do you see those as really being needed by your industry? I think over time they will be. I think um, you know we'll probably make some progress on the human spaceflight standards, and then we'll probably get to a point where we realize there's maybe a subset of additional standard development that would be helpful to you know, feed into the human spaceflight standards process along the way. Um, I do think there's some opportunity there for additional standards creation. Yeah, great. Um, let me just see, um, there's a question about the design of vehicles. Um, so what's, so it's, it's not just the, the operations, but also the design itself and, and how does that impact safety regulation, whatever it might be, integration. Any thoughts thoughts on the different designs out there? Because we see a lot of different sort of, uh, of uh, applications in this area. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that makes it challenging from a regulatory perspective. Yeah. Because on the one hand, you know, uh, the FAA wants the industry to have that flexibility to design what they think is going to be the best vehicle um, 
be able to design for reusability, for example. Um, and uh, on the other hand, you know, I, I understand that there's some concern about the, the regulatory environment, but I think what we've seen here based on the, the regulatory environment we've had is a wide variety of vehicles that are offering access to space, whether it's through, um, you know, uh, satellites, whether it's space tourism, um, or opportunities for commercial vehicles to, to partner with NASA to go up to the ISS or have orbital launches. So, you know, in some cases, we have uh, members that have balloons that they want to take people up sort of to the edge of space or really high altitudes to be able to kind of see the curvature of the Earth and really appreciate sort of a leisurely six hour uh, flight um, over the earth. You've got, um, uh, you've got vehicles that are crewed um, that have pilots in them. You've got vehicles that don't. Um, you have uh, horizontal vehicles that take off and drop um, their, uh, their spaceship from a high altitude and launch from there. You've got vehicles that launch vertically from the ground with the capsule on the top. So it's such a wide variety of, uh, of different of vehicles and designs of vehicles when you really stop and think about how varied they are compared to airplanes. Airplanes are, are all pretty similar. You know, they might be a little bit different in terms of jet engines or propellers or general aviation type use or commercial aviation type use, but the vehicle itself is all is, is pretty similar. You know, it takes somebody to fly it, um, generally speaking. It takes, um, you know, the shape is, is very similar uh, to each other, uh, to, uh, to different types of vehicles, but the space industry is very different. And that's why I think uh, making sure we get the regulatory environment right is absolutely critical because who knows what the next design might look like. It, it's probably gonna be something that no one's ever thought of before. Right. So I think having that kind of flexibility to innovate is gonna be really critical to the future of the program. So one, one question that I think is, it was a really good one. Um, it kind of addresses some of the transparency of uh, the launches in terms of operators actually providing uh, tele telemetry data to the FAA. Is it, it's, right now it's on a, I guess, a voluntary basis. It's not uh, required. Um, so as we talk about integration, NASA integration, and, and learning more about these, is, 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 is that a challenge that it's not more, more transparent? So not yet. I mean, I, uh, so I'll tell you that the ATO has put together a steering committee to talk about airspace access and integration to the NASA. And I'm, I'm a member of that steering committee along with three of our, um, so far, other member companies. And these are some of the more active companies and all of them are more than willing to share that information with the FAA because everyone has the same goal, which is um, to safely integrate into the national airspace system and to reduce that, that uh, launch window. So it's not this four hour block of time that's restricted because I mean, I can tell you from an airport manager perspective, having vehicles that we had to integrate into our airspace um, it was challenging, you know, it's challenging to, uh, to be able to integrate vehicles when you have restrictions because of the type of vehicle that's operating and that's launching. So the space industry is incentivized to work closely with the FAA to provide this data and this information, uh, because it's in their best interest also to reduce that window, open that up because they, you know, these people fly in airplanes themselves. So mm -hmm. Um, you know, no one wants to see uh, that, you know, continue to, to happen. So ATO is working very hard to get the SDI um, to that level. And industry is also um, eager to provide that information. From my experience, everyone that we've been working with is eager to provide the information. Um, come back to cybersecurity. Um, question is, NIST has, has developed a um, cybersecurity draft overlay um, that sets security framework and controls. Does the industry work with NIST on collaborating? Yes, um, and I would say, you know, the industry was pretty active, um, definitely under the last administration and continues to provide that information, um, you know, from a cybersecurity perspective, perspective because everyone has the same goal and, has, and the same interest. So um, the industry is constantly providing that information and partnering with various various mem uh, members of the government to um, to be able to have that same protection. Um, 
I, know, I noticed at the beginning you talked about um, some of the work your organization does in STEM and uh, certainly trying to find technically qualified individuals is always a challenge, although I think you've got a natural attraction because it's such an exciting industry. Um, but what does the CF, CFF do to attract some of that, those qualified and enthusiastic folks into your workforce? That's a, that's a great, that's a great question. And it is something that, you know, I sort of listed, you, you um, asked me a while back, you know, what are some of the challenges that the industry is facing? And that's absolutely one of the challenges is talent acquisition. Um, because like you mentioned, the people that are graduating with engineering degrees, they can go anywhere. You know, they don't have to work in the space industry. Although I do, I agree, like in a lot of cases, it's, it is a very attractive industry because it's so innovative and there's so much happening. There's so much activity and people are excited to, to work there. Um, but we absolutely don't have nearly the, um, the quantity of engineers that are graduating. The other challenge that this industry in particular has in terms of aerospace is most engineers or most people that are working on the, the, uh, the equipment, the hardware, have to be US citizens. So that's mm. another challenge because of ITAR restrictions that, that apply across the entire industry. Um, the good news is there are a couple of things going on. So there are several scholarship programs that are aerospace focused um, uh, from a, um, it's a couple of them from you know, the perspective of having more women more people of color involved in the industry. So I've I'm personally noticed having been involved in the industry for 15 years, how we've gotten, uh, how the new space industry in particular has become so much more diverse mm -hmm. than a lot of other industries that have a, a, a very uh, engineering focus um, capabilities. The other thing that's really encouraging is a lot of companies and a lot of our members specifically have STEM focused programs integrated within their own companies. So they recognize that this is an issue for the country, not so much for their business, but for the country, the shortage of engineers and what, why it's important for them, you know, specifically those companies to do the outreach and open up their doors to students and show them some of the cool things that are happening in their facilities. So I think that's really encouraging that the industry has largely taken the initiative to start these conversations early. I mean, in some cases, um, the elementary school level to get them excited about space again. So um, I'm, I'm personally excited about that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, it's key. We, sometimes I think we focus on the, the high school students, but I think we really do need to get, get, get active very early in, in, in the school system to really help develop that. Cause you know, that's when I was, shooting off little model rockets when I was, you know, first, second, third grade. So okay. it got me excited about, about space. Um, just kind of just to start winding things up, to two final questions. One is um, you mentioned um, the FA's AST office and, and Wayne Monteith just recently announced his, his retirement from, from the agency. Any thoughts? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the industry really enjoyed working with Wayne. I think we're all disappointed that he's leaving. But the good news is he's built, um, and, you know, so did George Neal. They built really incredible teams. And uh, these are now people that the industry have good working relationships with. So I think Wayne, uh, Wayne to Wayne's credit, you know, he, um, he got some really key people in place uh, because I think he knew that succession planning is just part of the is part of the job, part of anyone's job in a leadership role. So um, I think it's going to be left in really good hands. Uh, but that that department and the the AST one position is absolutely critical to industry and continuing to partner, build the relationship, making sure that we're sharing information easily. Um, I think that's something that's really unique about the industry. And having been on the airport side and aviation side of the business, this uh, the space operators work really closely with AST and have, you know, since uh, since I've been involved um, for nearly 15 years. So I see that continuing. That partnership will continue and will continue to develop. The other thing I think, um, just to Wayne's credit, what what he did is helped get AST a little bit more on the map within FAA. Uh, that's been a huge challenge for the industry in terms of not a lot of folks even at FAA knowing what AST is. 
So having been a, <laughs> an airport manager, you know, I had to often educate the office of airports on what AST is because we were dual licensed. We had a license from or we, uh, you know, we were essentially allowed to operate under the office of airports, but we had a spaceport license from AST. And so in my position, you know, I was kind of connecting the two organizations under FAA. So I think Wayne has gotten to the point now where most folks within FAA know what AST is now. Yeah, I, I mentioned this was our 17th series in, in, the web, in these, this webinar series. And Wayne was actually the one that started off. He was number our first webinar we did with him. And, just such a, a dynamic individual that really drove people, I think, in, into, into it and got the attention that it needed. So um, I know I was personally sorry to hear that he was retiring from the agency as well. So, and then one final question, um, just kind of a softball one for you, but you know, reflecting on your career, what, what would you say? Have you any, anything you would have done differently? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I suppose like I, I guess if I could go back in time, uh, 25 years, I would have encouraged myself to study science and engineering myself. Um, I studied business because business was easy for me. Finance was easy for me. So, um, it's, it was just sort of a, um, I guess, natural fit for me. And, um, I, I would have, if I could do things differently, I would have, um, chosen to challenge myself a little bit more and studied science and engineering. Because I will tell you, I actually did a, um, I did a talk uh, with a, a panel of wonderful women uh, about women in aerospace. And that was sort of the topic was, you know, did you have challenges as a woman in aerospace getting in? And I would say that I had more challenges as a business person getting into the industry <laughs> because in 2005, the industry barely existed. So why do they need business people? There's no business yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would have done differently. And that's something that I encourage my kids to do as well um, is, uh, you know, really uh, have, um, have that capacity of learning some science and engineering and just being curious. Yeah. Well, great. Um, well, you're doing a great job and, and uh, representing your members and, and, Thank you. Thank you for, for being with us today. Sure. I think it was a very informative and fascinating presentation discussion. So thank you. It's great. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I look forward to working closely with you and your members in the future. Thanks. Um, I've been speaking with Ms. Karina Dries, the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation based here in Washington, D.C. And as you heard, the, the aviation ecosystem is, is really growing beyond what we have traditionally thought of. And uh, we're gonna continue to bring guests to you via these webinars uh, in the future because they, they really are crossing those traditional boundaries of aviation. And they're very important in how we all prepare for the future of technology development and that integration into our national airspace system. So look for more from us on that. Again, I wanna just take a moment, thank you um, to all of our sponsors for today's webinar, the Airline Pilots Association International, Collins Aerospace, and the National Air Traffic Controllers Association who are our gold corporate sponsors this year. And for the audience, again, thank you for joining us today. I hope you found today's presentations educational, inspiring, and involving. And again, these, these webinars are being recorded. So if you want to review anything presented today or any of our past webinars, including if you want to go back and see Wayne, Wayne Montese's uh, presentation back uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, you can do so by going to the RTCA YouTube channel. I hope you all be able to join us for our next webinar, which is going to be held uh, Wednesday, April 20th, again, at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Our uh, topic next month is going to be on the challenges of frequency spectrum allocations and how it's important for the advancement of those new technologies. Uh, this will undoubtedly be another fabulous discussion with our panelists, not only from aviation, but from some of those tangential industries as well. So I think you'll really enjoy that one. Again, thank you for spending your valuable time with us and have a wonderful day.